The M2 MacBook Air is a powerful laptop, but it can get very hot depending on what you're doing. Now you've probably seen all the thermal mod videos popping up out there, but that is old news. The cool kids are strapping a full-sized desktop CPU cooler directly to the M2 chip and letting it rip. And that's what I'll be doing in this video. I'm going to see if I can unlock the true potential of the M2 chip and see if I can maybe make the M2 MacBook Air more powerful than the beefier M2 MacBook Pro that has a fan and additional GPU cores. Now before we start, obviously this idea is dumb and not realistic at all, and the warranty on this MacBook is almost certainly voided now, but hey, it's a fun little experiment at the end of the day, and I think you'll find the results very interesting. First things first, I need an all-in-one liquid cooler, more commonly known as an AIO. Luckily, I had my custom-built Intel 12900K and RTX 3090 gaming PC nearby, so I opened it up and took out the 240mm Corsair AIO. Next, I opened up the back of the M2 MacBook Air, and taking a closer look, you can see a very thin layer of thermal material covering the logic board and M2 chip. This is essentially tape and does almost nothing to dissipate heat. You can see what this looks like when the CPU is under full load. There's the M2 chip just to the right of the trackpad connector cable, and typically all this heat will just dissipate into the actual chassis of the MacBook and help to passively cool the M2 chip but not for long. Now, I needed to figure out some way to get the copper heatsink on the liquid cooler to make direct contact with the M2 chip. The easiest way I could think of was using a thermal pad. This one has a high level of thermal conductivity at about 12.8 watts per meter Kelvin. Now, this rating essentially tells you how easily heat will conduct through the material. And taking a look at some common examples, you can see what I mean. Air is obviously horrible, whereas something like copper is incredibly effective, but I'll leave that to another video. Now, typically when trying to transfer heat efficiently between two objects, you want the transfer medium to be as thin as possible. So that's why I went with a 0.5 millimeter thickness thermal pad, which is one of the thinnest I could find. Cutting it down to size, I moved the trackpad connector cable out of the way and stuck the thermal pad right over the M2 chip. I decided to leave the black heat shield on to protect the other components on the logic board. And at this point, it was just a matter of awkwardly placing the MacBook on top of the AIO pump, making firm contact between the thermal pad and copper AIO heatsink, and also using whatever I'd lying around to prop up the sides of the MacBook. And there we have it, the liquid cooled M2 MacBook Air in all its glory. And now for the fun part, let's see what this janky setup can do. Now, just before I disassembled the MacBook Air, I made sure to get some baseline temperature readings and performance data. When doing these tests, I propped it up off the table to mimic the height of the liquid cooler setup for accurate results. Then on the liquid cooled MacBook, the first thing I did was run the endurance CPU benchmark to compare the temperatures. After 10 minutes of the CPU cores being at 100%, you can see a massive difference between the two. The hottest performance core on the stock MacBook was 105 degrees Celsius versus just 72 on the liquid cooled version. Looking at the average overall temperature of the CPU, you can see a 35 degree difference. And when I whipped out the thermal camera, I found an almost 12 degree difference in the temperature of the chassis. Also, notice how much the heat spreads across the entire chassis of the stock MacBook versus how localized it is on the liquid cooled one. Now, none of this is really that surprising. Obviously, the liquid cooler is doing a very good job of sucking all that heat away from the M2 chip, but how does this impact performance? What kind of improvement are we going to see once all the thermal throttling is removed from the M2 MacBook Air? Starting with the trusty Cinebench benchmark, let's quickly have a look at how the temperatures compare over time. The x-axis being degrees Celsius and the y-axis being minutes. In this case, about 10 minutes. You can see the stock M2 MacBook Air immediately reached over 100 degrees Celsius and then constantly throttles throughout the rest of the benchmark. 
compared to the liquid cooled variant, which stays nice and cool the entire time. Looking at the performance differences, the liquid cooled M2 MacBook Air outperforms the non liquid cooled version by about 7% making it just as powerful as the M2 MacBook Pro. Next, I rendered a 10 minute 6K Blackmagic RAW timeline in DaVinci Resolve. I selected B-RAW because it's a codec that isn't supported by the M2's video encoders and decoders, so rendering this will really stress the GPU. During the render, the GPU cores were about 13 degrees cooler on the liquid cooled variant. And this cooler temperature resulted in an extraordinary result. The liquid cooled M2 MacBook Air was not only 24% faster than the stock version, but also 13% faster than the M2 MacBook Pro with its additional two GPU cores. Doing a long blender render resulted in similar results, the liquid cooled M2 Air coming out well ahead compared to its stock counterpart. Although this time it couldn't quite beat out the extra two GPU cores on the Pro, which really does seem to add up over time. Finally, I thought I'd take a look at the most interesting comparison, and that is gaming. I played Tomb Raider for 30 minutes straight to make sure the MacBook was nice and toasty before running the benchmark. And this is because while gaming, the GPU cores can get extremely hot. And on the stock MacBook Air, this typically causes a ton of throttling once the chassis heats up. So I wasn't really surprised when the liquid variant was a whopping 35% more powerful than stock and only 13% slower than the M2 MacBook Pro. So what do these results mean? Well, first of all, there's no practical way to liquid cool this machine and it's not something you'd realistically ever do. But what liquid cooling does do is it gives us an insight into how well the M2 MacBook Air regulates its thermals and also how its performance is impacted by the thin chassis and lack of a fan. And I have to say, I was surprised that I didn't see that much of a difference during CPU intensive tasks. This tells me that even though the M2 MacBook Air's cooling system might look pretty pathetic, in reality, it's really not that bad for CPU tasks at least. I mean, seriously, like I said before, there is no real heatsink here at all. Usually I'd say that's a poor design choice, but hey, it still manages to squeeze out some pretty impressive performance. And if we compare the M2 MacBook Air to the MSI Prestige 14 with a 12 core Intel 1260p CPU, which is what Apple used for that infamous chart, you can see some of the advantages. Although the M2 is not as powerful in terms of raw performance, its chassis is 40% thinner at just 1.13 centimeters versus 1.6 for the Prestige. It doesn't need a fan and only needs a quarter of the power. That being said, once you add that GPU into the mix though, that's where the M2 chip really starts to struggle. And I was honestly pretty surprised to see just how well the eight core GPU on the liquid cooled air competed with the 10 core GPU on the MacBook Pro. Now, the keen eyed among you may be wondering why the performance of the M2 chip didn't seem to increase that much in some areas, despite it having a ton of thermal headroom left while being liquid cooled. Well, this is because the M2 chip is limited by how much power or wattage it can use in total. It doesn't matter how cold you can keep the chip when it's only able to draw around 30 watts in total from the battery. Keeping the chip nice and cold just means it can use the maximum amount of wattage possible without getting so hot that it needs to cut back performance. Unlike the stock M2 MacBook Air, which throttled CPU clock speeds, for example, to less than half of what was possible. This is why I'm so excited to see an Apple Silicon version of the Mac Pro. I'm hoping Apple will crank up the wattage and cooling system and we'll really be able to see the true power of Apple Silicon. 